Our unison scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. But before we read together, let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious and living God, we do give you thanks for the gift of this day. We thank you now that we can hear your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant us understanding, illumination. Help us to receive these words that we've perhaps heard many times, but that we would receive them in a fresh way this morning to experience the joy, the mercy, the love that we have in Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. So John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, as is printed in your bulletin, let us read together. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear now God's word from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, revealed, you, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Easter Sunday last year, we had just begun this COVID-19 lockdown. And who knew? We thought, oh, it, it may go two or three months. Who knew it would go 28 weeks of recording services and presenting them just online all through the summer on Facebook and YouTube? And we were at home last Christmas Easter, watching on television and laptop computers, drinking coffee, in our robe and pajamas, yoga pants and sweatshirts. And now we're here in person to celebrate our joy of the risen Lord and to celebrate our church family and friends being gathered together. I appreciate you being here. Even though one of you said, you know, preacher, these pews just don't recline like my lazy boy at home. 
but we are here to celebrate Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, bringing us forgiveness, bringing us life everlasting. One of my seminary professors, Wade Huey, just drilled into us students the rubric for reading scriptures. Read the punctuation, and then punctuate your reading. If the reading is joyful, show it in your voice. If the reading is hard, show the struggle in your voice. If it's questioning, lift your voice. If it's demanding a commandment, strike it with a punctuation mark. Use pauses for effect. to let your listeners struggle with the passage itself and celebrate with speed and enthusiasm the good news that you have to share with them. So, how would you punctuate your reading of these passages? And on a greater note, pause for effect, (laughs) how would you punctuate Easter. I was intrigued by an article, a devotional a few years ago by Joe Lamusio, who asked, how would you describe Easter with only punctuation marks? If you couldn't use words, what would be your punctuation mark this Easter? To paraphrase Joe, maybe Easter is all go- good and joy and happy faces, so you use emojis at the end of your sentence. Maybe Easter is a comma, a pause, which makes you stop and think and evaluate and listen. Maybe it's a downer. It's just a big period. It's Easter. You, you thought there'd be more enthusiasm or something special, but it's not this year. Maybe you're sad, maybe you're grieving still, maybe lonely, isolated as we have been this year. Maybe Easter felt like a a period to his disciples. He was dead, he's buried, their hopes were dead, but wait, What's this these women are saying? The tomb is empty? The period is no longer a period. Now it's question marks. And sometimes the question mark is worse than the period. Now they're starting to doubt. He's not there. Where is he? Who took his body? The soldiers are gone? The stones rolled away? He's not there? Then where is he? And then the angel speaks to them, you remember? Why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen, just as he told you. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and and be crucified and and the third day rise again? Well, of course they remembered. But I wonder how long it took them, perhaps in their shock, to process this. And maybe the angel was saying, remember, Galilee, he told you all this is going to happen, third day, rise again in their blank stares as they try to piece it all together, and then the light goes on and said, of course, it is as he said. They do remember the periods are gone, the question marks are removed. Now it's an exclamation point. He's alive! And they run and tell the others, he's alive! And they don't believe, they question, and so they run to see for themselves. And how like John and Peter run into the grave and John the wise one stops and looks in the grave. And then here comes Peter running by him, zoom right into the grave, take it all in. Easter's an exclamation point of gratitude and, and praise for the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us life too. 
So how is your life punctuated these days? Is life is good and joyful? Is, for what are you giving thanks? Are you facing question marks today? Situations troubling you, still challenging you? What do I make of all this, God? What's going on in my life? Are, are commas causing you to pause and think, what's next? What do you want? What am I to do? Are grief and sorrow just leaving you dot, 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 start and stumble? I, I don't know. Are you stymied? Just just stuck. Well, but remember the phrase, don't put a period where God puts a comma. God has placed a comma. You're not done yet. You are not defeated. God is not through with you. God's resurrection power is in you. And remember that line from Gracie Allen, who is married to George Burns. Toward the end of her life, she penned in a final love note to George Burns, never place a period where God placed a comma. Gracie learned that when things look bad and you're frustrated and you tempt to give up, when you're facing a crisis or, or a setback or, or even a defeat, don't give up. Don't, don't just resign yourself. Because in Ephesians 3, verse 20, Scripture tells us that God is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God can do what we cannot. God puts a comma, not a period. So Colossians 1, 3, 1 through 4 that we read says, So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, not the things of the earth. He's at the right hand of God, seated there for you. Set your mind on things that are above, not, not on earthly things. As Christians, we get to view everything with a background of eternity, not just the present moment. We know that this world is not all that matters, and that God has a plan beyond anything we can imagine. We have hope. We have a higher calling to a greater good. We have the glory that Christ has. We will get to share with him when he returns, and we are revealed in glory too. It goes on to say that nothing can defeat God's power. Not death, not sin, not Satan, not despair. Nothing can defeat God. And the God who loves you has a plan for you, for your life, each and every one of you. You may run into some commas, but they're not a period to God because there's greater good yet to come. So if you're thre threatening to throw in the towel or you feel defeated, don't look at your own human limitations. Look to the God who has no limitations. Nothing is impossible with God. And with God's help, we can overcome anything and everything. Don't place a period where God put a comma. True, we don't win every battle. Not everything turns out the way we hoped it would or thought it should. Defeats are real. But defeat does not mean failure. With Jesus in your life, you regain dignity and purpose and meaning and direction. Easter happens over and over, and new life breaks in. New meaning has come. Jesus gives you a new aim, a new goal, a new sense of direction for your life, and a new power you did not know you had. Haven't you learned that? I ask with pause for effect. Because Easter happens when the power of self-restraint renders violence impotent. Easter happens when peace overcomes hatred and discrimination. Easter happens when arguments give way to solutions that bring respect and honor to everyone involved. Easter happens when concern replaces selfishness. Easter happens whenever God's power replaces death and defeat and despair with life and hope and joy and peace and ambition. 
So I love this story that some years ago, a community decided they were gonna put up a fence around the public cemetery. And when they asked one man for a contribution, would he be glad to contribute to the project? He said, no, you, you wouldn't? No, why do you need a fence around a cemetery? People who are out don't want to get in and people who are in can't get out. There is, of course, one exception. On Easter morning, the women and the disciples wanted to get in, and Jesus was going to get out. The women went to anoint the body of Jesus for safekeeping, for burial, to preserve his body. They wondered how they would get the stone away so they could get into the tomb. And when they arrived and the disciples came, the stone was rolled aside. They did get in. And Jesus had gotten out. Sometimes we put fences around our lives, around areas of our life that we don't want anybody to get close. We don't want to feel vulnerable. And sometimes we put a fence and a stone so tight that we're trapped and we can't escape ourselves. And sometimes the people we love and want to help put up a fence because they don't want us to get too close. They want to keep us safe from their vulnerable spots. But sometimes, by the grace of God, fences get removed. And we are allowed to come out. And they are allowed to come in. And together we find peace and joy and reconciliation. And wholesome relationships again. It happens all the time. And when it does, it's Easter all over again. Sometimes Easter is delayed. Answers take a long time in arriving. Sometimes Easter requires that we make changes. A new relationship, perhaps. Or a new set of friends who don't lead us astray. Or a new direction. Or a new location. A new place, a new home, new friends. But still Easter comes. Still life seeks to correct itself. And still the balance comes. God is still at work, and joy comes in the morning. In 1993, when we lived in Tennessee, the, the snowstorm of the century hit Tennessee. We got ice in West Tennessee. They got snow upon snow in East Tennessee in the Great Smoky Mountains. King Duncan, who was a pastor in Knoxville, Tennessee at the time, shares this true account that four medical doctors from Knoxville decided to go on a, week, a weekend hunting trip in the Smokies, and they just expected to be gone overnight. They had no idea the snow was coming, and they didn't bother to give their family or friends exactly the location where they'd be staying, and they felt their SUV was so strong it could get them through any conditions they needed to, so they didn't worry about anything at all until, imagine their surprise when the snow got deeper and deeper and their SUV was bogged down and they couldn't even get out of the SUV to get down the road to try to find help. They had no cell phone coverage there back in the cove and no one in the outside world knew where these men were. Smart men, but they didn't bring food for more than a day. And so now they're frightened. They think, what do we do? And at dusk of their second day of being stuck, they still had no contact with civilization. Somebody found a stale donut in the back of the SUV, so they took that apart and had that for supper. They were cold, they were hungry, they were anxious. Would anyone find them before they were frozen or starved? And then they heard it. Overhead, the sound of a helicopter. So they pushed the doors open as best they could, got out, waved at the helicopter, got his attention, and as he came close, they realized he could see them, they could see him, and they could see his helicopter was already full of other hunters or hikers. And then they saw a basket of some sort being lowered down, and all it had was a note, tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow? 
But the doctors told it on themselves. These sophisticated doctors jumped out of the SUV. They started dancing and doing a kick as best they could like a chorus line in the snowdrift, singing Tomorrow from Annie. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you. Tomorrow, you're only a day away. They're going to make it now. They'll be rescued tomorrow. Maybe that's the song we should add to our Easter repertoire. Tomorrow, that is the message of Easter. You may have this world now, but tomorrow we have the heavenly kingdom. Because Christ has conquered sin and death, comma, we can live resurrection lives now, comma, beginning right now, comma, this moment, exclamation point. And we can have hope for tomorrow and the great tomorrow and the great beyond before then, exclamation points galore. Jesus is alive and he is real and he is here for you, right here, right now, offering you life and hope and strength and courage and stamina and everything that you need, he is here to offer it to you. And if you'll accept Christ into your life and give your life to him, you can know the forgiveness and grace and mercy and peace and joy and anticipation and strength and courage and all the things that God has to offer you and wants you to have, the salvation that God has given us through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is risen today. Easter is happening all over again, and it happens every day when we put our faith in Christ our Lord. Seize the day of victory and go forth in the miraculous power of God. Alleluia, question mark? Alleluia, exclamation point. Thanks be to God. God, it's all that easy, isn't it? But it's all that hard but you have revealed your life, your love, your strength, your grace, your power to us. You have conquered death with life and you've conquered despair with hope. And sinners that we are, we know that we justly deserve your condemnation, but you choose to save us. How amazing is your love, O oh God, your grace, your mercy, and your peace. Jesus Christ is our salvation, so we thank you, O oh God, Enter our hearts today and cleanse us, renew us, take control of our lives and make us the persons you want us to be, that we may live life anew in Christ our Lord. We know without question that you come to us in our everyday lives, Lord, both in the worship and in our hectic world outside. Forgive us when we aren't ready for you and don't see you or feel you present. Forgive when we see Easter as a Sunday, not a season, or a way of life, or a fresh start. Bless especially your people who are overwhelmed by war or conflict, by despair, by injustice. Lift the shroud that is cast over all who live under the oppression of fear or, or, or hunger or pain or illness. Bless the peacemakers who are working in our countries and cities and villages and those who are peacemakers at home. Wipe away the tears of those who weep, O oh God. Replace their tears in the night with the joy of the morning and send your angels to watch over the vulnerable and the sick. Bless those that we love, O oh God, and for whom illness or loneliness or pain or suffering or grief just seem to abound. We long to be their shoulder to lean on and the arms to share their burdens. Help us then to be the face of Jesus to those who hurt. And at the same time then, O oh God, with the same assurance, we lift up to those who have rejoiced in a newfound faith, those who have reconciled with loved ones, those who have survived tragedy or sorrow, and, and who are happy again. We want to dance in celebration for their good fortune, O oh God, so we thank you. Thank you for Mary and the disciples who saw our risen Lord and witnessed to his resurrection that we might have faith too. May now our words, our deeds, our witness inspire others to have hope and trust in you too, O oh God. We commend to you, God, all for whom we pray, and bless and keep them and us in the name of Jesus our Lord who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Well, Mike.